Uh, this is chapter 9, The Greatness of God. Uh, so, here we go. When you think about the characteristics of God, uh, we've got to start somewhere. And uh, one place to begin is make the differentiation between the greatness of God and the goodness of God. This is sometimes called the, uh, the immense attributes versus the moral attributes or something. Different ways to characterize them. And just to kind of divvy things up. And so this is talking about God in himself more. And the goodness of God is God in relation with others more so. And there's a long list. I mean, we could go forever with the character of God. But there's a few things here in the book that are worth looking at. And beginning with the concept of spirituality. So what we're looking at here is the fact that God is a spirit, not a body. Uh, John 4.24 uh, Jesus says that God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And, and those are, and that characteristic is important. Uh, oh, in Exodus 33, uh, Moses says, show me your glory. And he says, you know, you can't. Uh, John 1.18, uh, Jesus says, no one has seen God at any time. But then he talks about himself as the one who comes from the, uh, the bosom of the Father in older language to reveal him. Uh, can we see God or not? Doesn't Moses see God in Exodus 34? Well, yeah, but we see uh, what we call a theophany, an appearance of God. Because our understanding is that God is not in embodied presence. Some would believe that, Mormons, for example. But that God is spirit means that he isn't limited to time and space, but in spirituality, he beyond those kinds of things. So we think about him being spirit. Another thing that's really important is that God has life, that God is a living God. Uh, I've done a lot of teaching in Taiwan, and one of the things that I see there is in their idols that they carry around. Uh, the idols that are, say, in the corner of a field, there's a little temple with an idol in it. If I go into a village, there's a bigger temple with an idol in it. If I go into a town, there's a bigger temple yet with an idol in it. If I go into a city, there will be a bigger temple with bigger idols up to Begong, which is for the whole region. And when, uh, when you have a local god during ghost month, the seventh month in the lunar calendar in the Chinese year, uh, people who do this sort of thing will put their god on a platform and they will carry the God to a bigger God. And the irony is the God can't walk. Uh, he's he's got to have people carry him around. And see, these gods are not living. These idols are just things. Though I do think there's probably gods that the idols represent. But what they call their gods, they've got to carry on a platform when they move them around. And they take the processions and that sort of thing. See, God is a very different kind of thing. God is, a, God is alive. So in Exodus chapter 3, good chance to look at that, Exodus chapter 3, uh, it's this story that God is, or Moses is out tending sheep, and the angel of the Lord appeared in a flame of fire within a bush. Moses saw it, though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up, so he said, I must turn aside and see this wondrous sight. That's one of the life verses. Moses noticed something strange about this bush, and he says, wow, so his Spiritual curiosity kicks in. I must turn aside and see this wondrous thing. So he goes over to the bush, and he hears the Lord speaking out of the bush and calls his name, Moses, here am I. Don't cut any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place you're standing is holy ground. So Moses does that, and then God, I'm the God of your fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses hides his face. And God goes on and speaks with him, but then uh, after he tells him, you're going to go to Egypt, verse 10, Moses says, who am I that I should go to Egypt? Very good question. And God responds, I'll be with you. It's not about you, Moses. It's that I am with you that counts. Okay, that's pretty cool. Then Moses says, yeah, but like, who will I tell him you are? And that's where God responds. And in 3.14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're say. I am sent me to you. Of course, this is the name of Yahweh coming out of the, the Hebrew phrase. So we 
we pronounce it probably correctly is Yahweh. And it just means I am the one who was, I am the one who is, I am the one who will be. Uh, and that connection of the everlasting faithful one that comes out of that. God has life in himself, John 5, 26, and he is the one who can say, I am the one you can depend upon. I am the one who is with you. I am the one who is living. It's a powerful statement. Uh, he is personal. Now, there's a thing I'd like to just unpack just a little bit. When you say God is person, a person is a uh, has mind, will, emotions, abilities to make choices, ability to relate, <clears throat> and we'd say all of those are true of God. So I'd say God is a person, means he's a, a being who can relate and choose and comprehend. And then we'd say God is personal. Uh, computers, like I've got here in front of me, are not personal. I do think they kind of savage you when you're not looking, uh, but they do it with a kind of an impersonal malice. They don't do it you know, like, you know, if, a, if I get in the way of a raccoon and it bites me, it does me in a personal kind of way. If I make a person mad at me and they punch me, that's very personal. Or when I relate to my pretty wife and she loves me, that's very personal. So a person is personal and a person has a personality. So I can distinguish Sherry from Bethany just by their personality. And when you think about God, we're thinking he is a person, that is there's an individual. In fact, we're going to argue that he is tripersonal, three persons, and that he is personal, means he can relate to us, and that he has personality that differentiates the Father from the Son and the Spirit. And, and that idea that God is personal is, means that he can relate. He can enter into relationships. It means he has a name, and he wants to do that. Uh, <clears throat> God is not limited by time or space. So he can be anywhere in time, anywhere in space, uh, as opposed to a God who had a body who would be here and not there. We believe Satan, for example, is here and not there and is not uh, that limited. God's knowing I mean, this is one of those big things uh, is that we look in Scripture and we find the idea that God knows everything. And the references are in your book. I won't go through them here. But I will get into one controversy that's kind of live. Uh, does God know the outcome of my personal choice? Uh, the, my friends who hold that, Greg Boyd, for example, would say that God knows all things in the future, but my choice uh, that I'm going to make free choice is not a thing until I make that choice. So I'm going to be at my church tonight for a meeting of leaders, and they're going to serve some food. And I know, because I'm one of the elders and I went through the plan, that there's going to be a break about halfway through the meeting tonight, and they're going to have food. And... Since I'm not going to get any supper tonight before I go to the meeting, I'm going to be interested in having some food there. What will I have for my mini supper at the leaders' meeting at my church tonight? And the answer is, I don't know. I, I don't know what the choices are. Now, does God know what the choices are, even though that's not set on the table yet? Yeah, because he's read the plans that the people are preparing the meal. So he knows what is going to be on that table tonight. But from Greg Boyd's perspective, God does not know which one of those choices I'm going to pick. Now, he'll know if there's anchovy pizza there, I'm not going to get anchovy pizza. I don't think there will be. He will know if there's something with raw onions in it that I won't eat it because I don't like raw onions. But there's going to be a five choices that are all going to be really good in which one I'm going to pick. And Boyd is going to say, God won't know until I make that choice because it's not a thing yet. And uh, he does this to solve some of the issues of the problem of evil, saying that God does not know the outcome of my free choice because it hasn't been made yet. No, I don't think that's correct. And let me show you why. Go to John chapter 13. Uh, toward the end of John 13, uh, the, where Jesus washes the disciples' feet in the upper room, he says, I'm going to go away. I'm going to only be here a little bit longer. He gives a new command, verse 34, love one another. Everyone who knows my disciples, you love one another. 
Simon Peter responds this. I'm only going to be here a little bit. Verse 36 is, where are you going? And Jesus said, where I'm going, you can't follow. But you'll follow later. And then Peter makes an, a strong statement. Lord, why can't I follow you? I will lay my life down for you. I'm so committed, I'll die for you. Okay? And what did Jesus say? Will you really lay your down life for me? <laughs> Very truly I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So Jesus makes a prediction of what Peter is going to do that night. It's already well into the night. He makes a prediction based on Peter's free choice. Now, I ask the question, does he just know Peter's character that he's a wuss? Well, would Peter lay his life down for Jesus? And the answer is yes, because you get into John 19, Jesus is in the garden, Judas comes up, betrays him with a kiss, and here come soldiers with swords. What does Peter do? He grabs a sword and starts hacking. Now, he proves he's inept because he can't even hit a guy with a sword, but he's willing to die. He is willing to die. For Jesus. He's willing to fight against an army of soldiers to try to protect Jesus. So when he says, I'll lay my life down for you, it's true. It's true. Jesus still says, before morning, you will deny me three times, not to soldiers, to servant girls. How did Jesus know this? He has to be able to know in advance, the Father telling him, what's going to happen with Peter. Can God know the outcome of free decisions? I think the answer is yes. I think it is. So I think when God knows all things, that God knows not only just past, present, but also future as well. Now, there's a whole other debate we'll get into there when we talk about decree and predestination. But I think God knows what's going on. Nothing catches him off guard. Nothing surprises him, although he has emotional responses to them. How about power? How powerful is God? And the scholastic term is omnipotence, and there's a number of passages, but look at Matthew chapter 19. If I look at Matthew 19, 26, so Matthew 19, 26, uh, talking about how can anybody be saved here, Jesus looked at him and said, with man this is impossible, and he makes this strong statement, with God all things are possible. Boy, that's a strong statement of power. Uh, can God do anything? And the answer is no. How do we know God can't do anything? Well, because he says so. God cannot lie. God cannot sin. So God can't do anything. But God never runs into anything that he wants to do that he can't do because he doesn't have power. God has plenty of power to do anything that he in his character decides to do. God never runs out of power, ever. And that's the thing we're talking about, is God can act and there is no limit on the power that he uses to act, except what he puts on himself. Uh, God could destroy sin, and the peace means really wants him to do that. But if he did that, he has to destroy sinners, and frankly, I'm glad that he hasn't done that because I've got some sinners who are now saved because God withheld the exercise of his power. But it's not a lack of power to the things going beyond it. One other idea that Erickson raises here, and that's the idea of constancy or immutability. It's a classic term. God does not change. Uh, so Malachi 3.6, well, let's look at it. Good thing. Hard to talk about God in theology without the Bible. But look at Malachi chapter 3. Are you there? If you're not, go there. Come on, be good. <laughs> I'll send my message. I said to the Lord, your coming will come in his temple. Uh, who can endure the day of his coming? Malachi 3, 2. What does it mean? Evil people will be judged and destroyed in the day of his coming. Who can stand when he appears? It would be like a refiner's fire. You'll see a refiner and purifier and all that. <clears throat> uh, so when I come, verse 5, I will put you on trial. I will quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, and so on. 
those who oppress widows, the fatherless, deprive the foreigners among you of justice. Then in verse 6 he says this, I, the Lord, do not change. So there it is. God does not change. I mean, it's stated in so strong a term. Okay, That's one data point that we look at. Let's go to another data point. Uh, Second, Sam, Second Kings, chapter 2. So go there. Second Kings, chapter 2. Chapter 20, sorry. Second Kings, chapter 20. Hezekiah, good king. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was to the point of death. The prophet Isaiah went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you're going to die. You're not going to recover. So here's the word of the Lord. Get your will in order because you're like dead. What does Hezekiah do? He turns his face to the wall and prays to the Lord. And he pours his heart out. Remember how I've walked faithfully, wept bitterly. Please, 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 he says. Verse 4. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. Now, wait, wait, wait. I, the Lord, do not change, Malachi 3.6, but here in 2 Kings chapter 20, he says you're going to die. Hezekiah prays, and then God says, oh, I've seen your tears. You're not going to die. Does God change or not? Well, see, this is where you have to stop and think about things and use the scripture and think carefully. Because here, there's one example where God clearly responds to prayer. Uh, Exodus chapter 32, when God is so angry about the golden calf, he and Moses talk to each other, and it says, and God relented, he nahamed, he had compassion on, and he didn't kill him. So God responds to prayer, he responds to repentance, but he does not change. Malachi 3.6, Numbers 23.19. How do you work this out? Well, here's the way I work it out. <clears throat> Some would say, and Dr. Erickson is one of those, that God does not change, but we change so we experience God differently. Um, and that's a, that's a common view. So God is always unchanging in his character and attributes. God is always unchanging in his attitudes and actions. But we change so we experience God differently. <clears throat> I'm of the opinion uh, that God's character does not change. These attributes are going through never change. God is always gracious and compassionate. God is always slow to anger, loving and faithful and forgiving and just. That never changes his character never changes. Uh, his essence, his godness, never changes. Uh, his knowledge, the content of what he knows, never changes. He never, in a sense, learns new things. Uh, so those never change. But, 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 it seems to me that God's attitude can change in response to prayer or his actions can change in response to prayer. So here we see Hezekiah praying and God responds to that. Moses prays for the people of Israel in Exodus 32 and God responds to that. Uh, before that, the people start worshiping the golden calf and God becomes angry. There's a change of attitude. So I would see God does change his attitude and his actions based on prayer, repentance, rejection, so his attitudes and actions may change, but his character, his essence, his promise never change. So how to understand Malachi 3.6? I, the Lord, do not change. Well, I think that's the way it is. What God is saying there is you guys are as wicked as you can be, but I'm not going to crunch you. I'm not going to kill you. Why? Because I do not change. I made a promise that you will be the people through whom Messiah come, and I'm not going to relent on that promise. I'm not going to violate my promise. We can totally depend on God's promise. We can totally depend on his faithfulness, his promise. He is constant. But what happened, he may delay the payment on that promise, 
based on our repent or rejection, he may give us things sooner because of our responsiveness or our prayer. So this way I put it together. God is unchanging in his essence, character, promise, and knowledge, but he can respond to us based on our prayer, rejection, or repentance. Uh, my friend Bruce Ware wrote his whole dissertation on this and has written on a number of cases, and I'd refer you to look at his material. This is a place where there's difference in church, is how we put together the pieces of how God changes in relation to our prayer and our repentance. It's a good thing to ponder on. And if you want to do a bit of homework, here's what I'd suggest. Go take a look at the way that God responds in the potter story in Jeremiah 18. Uh, it's, it's quite a story. So I'll leave this to your pondering. And what you'll see as you read down through about a verse 11 there is a picture of how God does respond or with judgment or uh, with compassion. So a little homework for you. Ponder God, it's worth it.